If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. I want to talk to you tonight about the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus. There's handouts back there. If you forgot to pick one up, Lonnie's standing right there. He'd be glad if you'll raise your hand. He'll bring them right to you. The name of Jesus. And let me give you the outline. Number one, and these are short, the need. Okay, the need. Number two, the name. The name. And number three, the reaction. The need, the name, and the reaction. You know, the emphasis in Acts 3 and 4 is the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We know names are important because a name identifies the person who is being spoke about. Some names carry much authority. When you hear the name, the President of the United States, uh, there's much power there. There's also power when you hear the name Five Star General, okay? But the absolute most important name given to anyone who ever lived on earth is Jesus Christ, our Lord, the only begotten Son of God. He has absolute power and authority over every living being and nature. Only He deserves our worship, our praise, and obedience. Let's look at uh, Luke's amazing true story of another day in the life of Peter and John. Acts chapter 3 verse 1. And you have to remember, this is right after Pentecost, okay? Early, early uh, in Acts. Now, Peter and John went together to the temple to the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And again, the ninth hour was the 3 p.m. prayer, and Peter and John did a lot of things together. Uh, and, And even though they were born again, and the church was just starting to birth, okay? They still had habits that they did. As Jews, uh, you went three times a day to pray. You went at nine in the morning, noon, and 3 p.m. And so uh, they were doing what they always do. And of course, prayer is always very, very important, uh, regardless of what religion you are. And a certain lame man from his mother's womb was carried whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple. And again, the lame man means he never walked. They said from birth, from birth. Uh, And it says he was carried. He physically, there was no way for him to get there. And you you saw this a lot in, in New Testament times. Uh, you know, it's kind of like our folks uh, that are on the street corners now, okay? They all walk there, uh, although I have seen a few in wheelchairs and all, but basically uh, they either can't work or don't work, uh, and they're there begging for money. And it said, who, who uh, they lay daily at the gate, which means every day, folks. I mean, I, I can't imagine not being able to walk. Okay, I, ju- I just, you know, to, to not be able to get on our feet, uh, to not be able to, you know, walk outside or, and, and you know, there, there has to be, and, and the only other thing that I think might be worse than that is to be born blind, and we're going to talk about that in just a second, uh, which is called uh, beautiful, which, by the way, there were nine gates, and it was the eastern gate, the, the one called beautiful, to ask alms who those entered the temple, who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, ask for alms. And he uh, made eye contact with them. And I know what some people do, and, and I've probably done it myself before. If you don't look at him, you don't feel obligated. All right? And, but, but this man, this man who was crippled from birth, looked at Peter and John and asked uh, for alms. So we see uh, this man was begging, this man was lame, uh, this man asked specifically for money, okay? And, and money in that, that, those days uh, was just, it was important. You know, that was his way. I mean, he couldn't earn wages, he couldn't work for it, and uh, to put food on the table, uh, to do anything that he needed to do, it all takes money. 
Hold your finger there and go to John 9 with me if you would. John chapter 9. John chapter 9. And look at verse 1. Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned this man or his parents that he was born blind? And, you know, the human side of the disciples, uh, you know, was just wondering, you know, you, you kind of think out loud and, you know, it, it probably was Peter because a lot of times Peter, if he was thinking it, he was saying it. So they thought, well, if he's blind, you know, somebody sinned. Uh, in in their life. And Jesus answered them, and, and I don't know that they were ready for this answer, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. See, Jesus was basically saying sin did not cause it, and God didn't make him blind. Because, and, and folks, what I what I believe is it was when Adam and Eve sinned, death and disease and all these things came into the world. I don't think God was thinking, okay, a specific name, I'm going to make him blind. All right? It's just, it's, sometimes it's life, sometimes it's accidents. Uh, these two that we are talking out about, one was born blind and one was born lame. So Jesus ba basically said, uh, why do you have to blame somebody? Okay, he just said it basically happens. Neither, it's neither of their faults. And then he says in verse 4, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. And Jesus was always working. And, and that's what I love about our job. Okay, uh, if you love to do something, it's not work. It's really not. If you love to do something, it's not work. Matter of fact, you know, the pay, I mean, everybody, you know, Steve and I need to be paid. We've got to pay bills. We've got to do these things. But it is a joy to do what we are doing and, and investing in ministry and investing in people and loving people and pointing people to Jesus Christ. So Jesus was basically saying, uh, I knew this guy was here. I knew what was going to happen. I knew you were going to ask this question because he was all-knowing. And he basically is saying there is a reason for everything that goes on in a man's life. Okay, it doesn't catch God by surprise. But he was saying basically, I'm here at this point because I'm working. Okay, I'm doing my father's work. And folks, it's, it's just like, you know, sometimes uh, we get all excited about God's timing. You know, I mean, Mary and Martha was mad because, you know, they literally said, Jesus, if you were here, Lazarus wouldn't have died. And he was telling them, listen, I've got a bigger plan. Okay, I've got a big plan for, for, for Lazarus and, and for now. And you're, you're about to see what's going to happen. And even in those instances, folks, God was up to something. And lots of times, especially in the New Testament, God met a human need so that he could uh, uh, share a spiritual truth. And that's what he is doing here. So he says, I must work the works of him who sent me. They, the night is coming when nobody can work. As long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. And folks, he did healing different ways. Okay? Uh, sometimes bl the blind, he would just walk up and, and he would heal them right then. And another blind, an, another example, he told them to, and, and this is the example uh, later on if you read through there, hey, you put that clay in your eyes and you go and you wash and you will be, uh, you will be healed. Okay, and that part, that deal was, one is, I think the key word there is obedience. And the point of the first point, the, the first point is, folks, everyone has needs. This lame man had a need. He, he wanted to walk. He, he got up every day hoping that he would walk. This guy in John 9 was blind. Every day he got up and he thought, man, if I could only see my sight. But what Jesus was spiritually telling them is, 
I am telling you, the greatest need you have is not, and, and again, I'm not in their shoes, but I do know, uh, you know spiritually what Jesus was saying. He's saying the greatest need you have is to be saved, to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and to be saved. And, and that's what he was saying. There was a huge need, but I'm telling you, uh, you know, and, and the other thing is, his need uh, was more than just money, okay? Because even if he bought some food, he was going to be hungry again. But Jesus was the bread of life. And so Jesus used these instances where there were people in great need so that he would present the gospel to them and that they would understand who Jesus was. So there was a great need in this man's life. Now, the second thing is not only the need, the name. The name. Look at verse 4. And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look at us. So the guy really stared them down. The guy out loud asked for money. And Peter looked around eye to eye. Folks, I, I can't tell you how uh, important eye contact is. You, you connect with people when you look them in the eye. That's what I hate, hate about uh, social media or an email or, a, you know, uh, I can't remember. You, I used to be on Facebook. I can't remember. A message or something. Somehow you can, you, because really you can say anything you want and, and all, all you get is more words back at you. But when you folks look people in the eye, you are connecting with that person. So Peter, I believe since the Holy Spirit was there, the Holy Spirit said, hey, you need to help this guy. So he looked at him, and he said, look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. And, and again, I mean, he was wanting uh, money. He was just thinking, man, if, if these guys, if these two guys will just give me money, uh, my day would be a lot better. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. Folks, that's one thing you need to understand. You don't, it's, it's not the amount of money given. It's the love that those people uh, can sense in your life of you gave them something. Okay, and I'm not saying you should give everyone that is begging money. I always talk to the Holy Spirit. I always ask the Holy Spirit and God, God, do you want me to give, these, give you money? And, and I heard... Uh, about Charles Spurgeon, uh, one thing I'd heard about him, uh, he had no money on him, and there was somebody begging, and, and Charles Spurgeon told him, uh, he said, brother, I have nothing, but I can give you prayer. And the man said, uh, sir, you've already gave me something because you called me brother. Folks, that's what connecting with people is. You look past their faults. You look past, uh, you know, their challenges, and you do something, folks. Everybody can do something to help people in need. It doesn't have to be. And I'm, I'm just going to figure out here. It's not giving them a twenty dollar bill or a hundred dollar bill. It's being nice to them. Okay. It's it's if you sense they're hungry, it's literally going to someplace. Not saying here's five bucks, go get you a hamburger. You say, you stay right here. I'm going to go get you a hamburger and I'll be right back. So it says, he said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. I noticed two things about Peter. Okay? Number one, he used, I mean, Peter knew he had no healing power. Okay? And I understand, you know, uh, all of the Gospels to where, you know, when Jesus was there and he gave him power to do this and this. Okay, but Peter was smart enough to know, I, I, I can't do this on my own, but I know someone that can heal you. Folks, we know somebody that can heal people. We know the Lord Jesus Christ. We know him, and folks, he's healed many a person. But it's not just physical healing, folks. It's the spiritual side of things. 
that spiritual healings last forever. Healing only lasts a certain amount of time. You can, somebody get, for instance, Lazarus was raised from the dead, but I got news for you, he died again. When you give somebody eternal life, when you give somebody Jesus Christ, that gift and that love lasts forever and ever and ever. So he says, in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. Folks, the second part of that is not just connecting with them eye to eye, not being personal with them, but touching them also. When you shake someone's hands, and and I understand the world in which we live. I understand COVID. I understand all of that. That's why we have bottles of stuff at the back of there. And I'm telling you, on a Sunday, I I do my hands at least five or six times. Why? Because I want to connect. I want to stand back there. I want people to think I care about them. I want people to think, hey, you know, uh, Brother Mike loves me. And that's what, that's what was going on. Peter took him by the, hand, the right hand and lifted him up. And you're not talking about put his hand under him and made him get up. He was simply saying, take my hand. Take my hand. Peter already knew what God was going to do. Peter had that kind of faith. And the Holy Spirit had already talked to him and told him it wasn't an accident that he came in. There were nine gates, folks. It wasn't an accident that he was at that gate. At every nine gates, where there was probably someone begging there. It wasn't an accident that this guy is the one he chose. God knew what he was doing. Jesus always knows what he's doing. And he had a divine appointment that day. And he took him by the right hand, lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. Well, I tell you folks, the name of Jesus Christ is so powerful. When you are doing spiritual warfare, when Satan is all over you, you need to speak the name of Jesus Christ. Why? Because it's powerful. Why? Because Satan hates that name. The demons hate that name. And that's what I'm saying. When spiritual warfare happens at night, which it seems to happen a lot, a lot of times at my house. I'm telling you, I sing songs and hymns that have Jesus' name in there. In Jesus' name. Folks, the Bible says Peter gave them a direct command. He obeyed the, the command and God healed him. Folks, the name of Jesus is so, so powerful. Isaiah chapter 9. Go with me to Isaiah 9. Isaiah 9, verse 6. And folks, this is is Old Testament. This is Isaiah. This is 700 years before the Messiah. This is a prophecy of who Jesus is and who Jesus was going to be. And and I, I really don't understand people that don't believe the Word of God Folks, I am telling you, it is truth. It is yes. It is amen. It is everything. If God said it's going to be that way, it's going to be that way. For unto us a child is born. Notice the C part, the large C, which means deity. The deity there. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son, capital S, is given. And the government will be upon his shoulder. And folks, he wasn't talking about, you know, our government as we think of government. He wasn't talking about the Roman government. Folks, he rules everything. He runs everything. He's coming back. He's coming back as king. He is coming back for his children. And his name will be called Wonderful. Man, isn't Jesus wonderful? Is he not wonderful? He is counselor. Folks, the Word of God is the best counselor there is. Yes, we need to listen to people. Yes, we need to connect people. Yes, we need to advise people. But the Word of God and Jesus, uh, God will never tell you the wrong thing. Jesus will always counsel you the right way. 
His name is Wonderful Counsel, Mighty God. Folks, I'm telling you, he knocked walls of Jericho down. He parted Red Seas. He raised the dead. Everlasting Father. We're going to be with him forever and ever. And the Prince of Peace. You know what? Everyone truly wants in their life. They probably won't tell you this, but everyone wants peace. Peace on earth. Goodwill to men. And folks, you can't have peace in your life without personally knowing the Prince of Peace. Folks, we shouldn't worry. We should not worry. I don't care what the news says. I don't care what's going on in our lives. God gives us peace. And hit that name means so much. Prince of Peace. Of the increase of His government peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over His kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice. From that time forward, even forever. Folks, I am telling you, he was healed at that moment, but I believe with all my heart, if you read the rest of the story, he was healed spiritually also. God, through Peter, healed this man. And then he found out about salvation. And I'm telling you, he was healed forever. He was not going to die that second death. And the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. The need, the name, folks, the name of Jesus is so powerful. Look at Philippians chapter 2. Philippians 2. Philippians 2, verse 9. Therefore God has highly exalted him. Notice the him. He's talking about Jesus. Man, highly exalted. Told everybody about him. Through the word, through prophecy, through prophets, through the preaching of the word in the New Testament, from Paul to Peter to all them, God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. Oh, folks, that name, and names are important. Names are important, folks. And there is no greater name according to the Word of God and according to what we are uh, reading in the book. There is no name more important than Jesus. Folks, Jesus changed history. Jesus changes lives. Jesus' name is the most powerful. And, and a lot of times we associate money with power. But I'm telling you, it doesn't ha matter how much money you make. It doesn't matter what you're worth. You can be the richest man in the world. And if you die without Christ, you are broke. You're a pauper. You have nothing. You will live forever apart from Jesus. And folks, his name is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth. You know what that in, talk, talks about? Folks, that's everybody. Everybody's going to stand before God. Everybody's going to kneel and bow and recognize Jesus is Lord and that every tongue could confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Oh, folks, Jesus' name, it's amazing. It's wonderful. It's blessed. It's worth memorizing. It's, and, and there's so many names. I mean, we read Isaiah 9. There's so many more names. The Lion of Judah, the Bright and Morning Star. He is all that, folks. And his name is so powerful. Now let's look at the reaction. Man, I love this. I love the ending. This is a happy ending. Look at verse 8. So he, okay, talking about the man that was crippled from birth, leaped up and stood and walked, entering the temple with them. He didn't notice. He didn't stand up and run home and tell everybody. He wanted to stay with Peter and John because there was something different about these two. Do you realize that he couldn't go into the temple before this? 
He couldn't get in there. Why? Because uh, he was considered by the Jews, and many people thought he was cursed, that God put a curse on him, and he could not go into the regular common temple. And so he stood up, leaping, and, and, and entered the temple, walking, leaping, and praising God. He would make a Baptist service really nervous, okay? I'm serious, he would. Because he was so excited about what God did. He leaped then, and he kept walking and leaping. And notice what else he does. He's praising God. Can you imagine the scene? Well, it it tells you. And all the people saw him. Okay? This guy was so happy. I mean, there are happy dances. Okay? But this was more than a happy dance. This was a happy parade. He kept leaping. He kept, uh, uh, you know, uh, being happy. He kept, he was so excited about what was going on in his life. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. Then they knew it was he who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. Nobody could deny that. Nobody could say, oh, maybe he has a twin brother. Why? Because so many witnessed what was going on. Folks, it was a prayer time. There were many people going in at this time to pray. And I'm telling you, the word spread quickly, quickly about what was going on. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what happened to him. And folks, I believe with all my heart, I really do. If you just read the rest of the story and all that was going on, later on he said, you know, whether he is a sinner or not, you know, they just, I mean, the scribes and the Pharisees uh, just got all over him and saying, you know, uh, you know, you, you must not be, let's talk to his parents, let's do this. And he said, basically his testimony is whether he's a sinner or not, I have no, no clue. But even that, no, I'm getting it mixed up with the blind guy. I just realized that. But what I'm saying was everything changed in his life. Everything changed in his life. And folks, uh, you know, just, you know, the things he, he couldn't have walked before. He, he you, know, you know, he probably wasn't just overly joyful before, but everything in his life. It changed. Look at Psalm 150. Psalm 150. Folks, I believe with all my heart, we, don't, we do not praise enough. We really don't. We, have, we need to praise God more and more and more. Psalm 150. Praise the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty permanent. Praise Him for His mighty acts. Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. Praise Him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise Him with the lute uh, and the harp. Praise Him with the timbrel and the dance. Praise Him with string instruments and flutes. Praise Him with loud cymbals. Praise Him with clashing cymbals. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Three times it says praise the Lord. Nine times it says praise Him, and one time it says praise God. Folks, I'm telling you, that man was one happy guy. And folks, I believe with all my heart, we don't praise the Lord enough. I know we do it every Sunday. I love our praise team. Folks, we need to praise Him out in public. We need to testify about what God has done for us and how He has blessed us us. Just turn a chapter over to Acts chapter 4, and I close with this, Acts chapter 4. Then Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit and said to them, rulers of the people and the elders of Israel, if we uh, this day are judged for doing a good deed to a helpless man, by what means has he been made well? Let it be known to you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, God raised him from the dead. By him this man stands here before you whole. And this stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. What did Peter do? He took 
an opportunity to preach the Word of God and share the gospel. He was on trial. And what did he do? He wasn't defending himself, folks. He was defending God. He was defending Jesus Christ. And here's the verse. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Sweetest name I know. Folks, I pray that you will be a person of praise because of the name of Jesus. Father, thank you. Thank you, thank you for this. Not just a story, Lord, it's a fact. It happened. It was real. And God, I thank you that you're still in the healing business. And God, I pray that, oh Lord, we would uh, just be like Jesus when we see folks hurting and when we can help people, Lord. I I pray that we would just slow down. I pray that we would help those that we can help. And God, I pray that we would, uh, in, in something, we, we all can do this. We can take people by the hand and just pray for them. And we can simply ask them, can I pray for you? Can I pray for you? And God, I know that would mean a lot. It would mean a lot to your kingdom And I know it would mean a lot to people who are hurting and people who are helpless. So God, I pray that you would make us men and women of prayer. And God, I thank you for examples like this. Because the bottom line is, there is no greater name than Jesus Christ. We need to be proud of that name. We need to be proud to share that name. We need to tell people about the name of Jesus. So God, thank you for this Bible study that we've had tonight. Thank you for this time that we have together. And God, I pray that we will be like this man. We will be like him. We won't be, you know, just not ashamed, but Lord, when when you tell us to praise you, I, I pray that we will do it, Lord. He was so excited about being able to walk. God, you healed him. God, I pray that we'd never, never forget that you healed us also. We were dead in our trespasses and sin. And God, you breathed life into us. So God, I pray that we would be busy sharing that life and telling people about Jesus and what you've done in our life. God, will give you the glory for all. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We thank you for joining us this evening at Rye Hill Baptist Church, and may God truly bless you.